to the Loins of History, a podcast that connects the past to the present. We're going to continue our series on the history of U.S. and Chinese relations. And last week, we talked about the Taiping Rebellion and the influence of Western Christian missionaries on the culture of China. And for this week's episode, we're going to get into the Boxer Rebellion. So, Jay, can you tell us how the Boxer Rebellion is relevant to the U.S. and Chinese relations? Yeah, absolutely. Um Long story short, there's two schools of thought in China on the Boxer Rebellion. And the first one is that they were great patriots that sacrificed their own lives to repel the foreign devils, <laughs> right? <laughs> but then there's another school of thought says they were violent rebels uh, that killed way more Christ- or way more Chinese than foreigners, uh, and that their irresponsible actions brought unspeakable suffering to the nation. These are the two schools of thought for how they're viewed in China today. But and like we're going to talk about in this episode, the Boxer Rebellion was primarily an anti-foreign and anti-Christian conflict. It makes it unique to, to Western learners, Western listeners, uh, Westerners trying to understand because there's not too many, at least for Americans, where we had like entire wars where we were trying to rid ourselves of group of people. Even even the Civil War, we weren't trying to get rid of African Americans, <laughs> right? Well, we were trying to get rid of the British in the revolution, I guess. <laughs> yeah, okay. Fair point. <laughs> We were we were actually trying to get rid of of the queen and her nasty tea, or sorry, the king and her nasty tea. Sorry, no offense to the late queen. <laughs> so Jay, that's pretty interesting on the schools of thoughts. But looking at the Boxer Rebellion, how did it actually start? Can you walk us through a timeline of some important events? Yeah, yeah. Let's actually tell the story here because we Americans in particular, <clears throat> we. We hear about the Boxer Rebellion, but as what I learned in doing research for this episode was that we don't actually know anything about what happened. <laughs> it's kind of kind of similar to the Taiping Rebellion. It's very much glossed over. This was like a paragraph in a high school history textbook, I feel like. Yeah. And it was almost exclusively like <clears throat> the Boxers were Chinese people that tried to kill Westerners. But we killed him back. Move on. <laughs> yeah, it was one question on a multiple choice test. The the story here is fascinating because the United States played a we played a part, but kind of what we've been talking about in our last two episodes, the role of the United States relative to our Western and Japanese counterparts was American imperialism looks very different than European or Japanese imperialism uh, in this in this space. How this turned out was essentially you had an eight nation alliance, which, you know, for our Lord of the Rings fans out there, like Tolkien beautifully like in in the Hobbit, what was it, the Battle of the Five Armies or Five yeah, Nations yeah, the, or something like that? Battle of the Five Armies. Imagine nine. Now, granted, eight of those nine were on one side (laughs) and not, you know, it wasn't everybody for themselves type deal. But, you know, you had an eight nation alliance in this eight nation alliance. You had um, you had the Germans, the French, the British, the Russians, the Japanese, the Americans, the Italians and the Austro-Hungarians. That was the formal eight nation alliance. You also had somewhat involved, but not as officially part of the eight nation alliance. You had the Dutch, the Belgians, and the Portuguese who all had interests in China. All of them played some kind of role within the Boxer Rebellion. And they were all on the side of suppressing this rebellion. So it's a fascinating period that kind of culminates in this siege that takes place in Beijing that we'll get to uh, called uh, the Siege of the International Legations. And it was a 55-day siege where a few hundred soldiers like held off like tens of thousands of, of Qing and Boxer soldiers. Super interesting. So- it's uh, interesting. I do want to make one point. It's interesting if you yeah. look at that ali- that eight nation alliance, the politics and the alliances within Europe at the time 
a lot of these countries were not at, at this point, not enemies. However, they were not exactly friendly as we would say. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the, at this point, the Germans and the French had fought um, a war in 1871, the Franco-Prussian war, just 30 years before. Um, the Austro-Hungarians and Germans would become the central powers along with Italy. So it, the, I point that out to say that it was an eight nation alliance, but this alliance was not like found in like a co the common interest was their own selfish interest. Like, Hey, we want, right. we want good trade. Like, Hey, you and I are kind of alike and we're, we're going to benefit from this. Let's go together and suppress this very, very large country, which is probably by land mass and population larger than all of our countries put together. So, Hey, it's in our best interest to work together, even though we have a lot of historic, our own historical grievances and uh, we don't like each other very much. Like the, right. the Japanese and the Russians fight each other in five years. So I just, That's I just right. want to point that out. It's not like an alliance made of like of shared value other than we want to no. get rich. Yes. We want to further our interests in your country. <laughs> uh, no, that's a that's a good point. All right. So in our last episode, we kind of talked about American um, relations with the Chinese kind of in the second half of the 1800s. And some of the things that we talked about in that episode was growing missionary influence in China. The Americans had a very large presence. The British, uh, if anyone's ever heard of Hudson Taylor, uh, he was probably the most famous uh, international uh, missionary to China. He was a Brit. These This growing missionary influence began having increasing pushback by the Chinese people themselves. Uh, again, like we mentioned in previous episodes, it's very hard if you're if you're Chinese, it's very hard to distinguish between, hey, this person is just trying to talk to me about their religious values versus this person is trying to take my property versus this prop this person wants to like, you know, sexually assault my entire family. <laughs> the you just don't know. You just see the white devil, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, or work, or you know. Additionally, you see a Japanese person in your country um, that you've had beef beef with for hundreds of years. So, um, this growing influence, J Chinese culture responded in a couple ways, but one of them was the creation of these martial arts societies, and they they initially began as anti bandit. Uh, anti-banditry, which banditry is has has been a thing um, very similar to like Korean and Japanese piracy, where, uh, but you know, in the in the Chinese countryside, these bandits for thousands of years, it was a thing. Uh, you know, you would just kind of make your living by stealing things from people and uh, selling it um, on the on the black market, so to speak. But uh, they they formed as these anti-banditry societies, but then the people began, you know, seeing the weakness of the Qing dynasty. They wanted people to, you know, push back against the foreign influence. So one of these uh, martial arts societies called the Righteous and Harmonious, Harmonious Fists. That's an amazing name. I just want to point that um, out. The harm Righteous and Harmonious just, Fists. That's right. Um, yeah, we are we are much less uh, eloquent uh, and flowery in our language. <laughs> we, we the, I think, uh, English uh, language in particular from our you know we get this from our Brits. We're we're much more Spartan. We're laconic in our. We try to be. We value brevity, whereas righteous and harmonious fists love it. <laughs> uh, so they they began to form, and there were there were quite a few others. We'll actually talk about one more in this episode, uh, the Big Sword Society, because they played a role here too. But uh, the Righteous and Harmonious Fist became known as the Boxers. Uh, and historians think that American missionaries were actually the first ones to start using the term Boxers, because these uh, these men that would join this martial arts society, they would practice various forms of physical training and martial arts, in their their slogan was restore the Qing, repel the foreigner. Uh, and they gained a lot of support specifically in uh, the Shandong Peninsula, which uh, east coast of China, 
maybe halfway, a little over halfway up the Chinese coastline. It's considered northern China. Um, that was where the boxers got their original start. Go ahead. From the Taiping Rebellion, really since the Opium Wars, the Qing Dynasty has been in a serious decline. And now after the Taiping Rebellion, there is um, an economic crisis where you have a lot of, um, as they said, unemployed young men. Young men have too much time on their hands. They typically get kind of radicalized. And so this was like a powder keg waiting to happen. So you have this foreign influence coming in, eroding their cultural values, contributing to the spiritual warfare or the spiritual war that Mao Zedong called it. They probably saw their grandparents killed in the Taiping Rebellion. And now for decades, at this point, decades, they've lived through economic crisis and they've had this basically impotent Qing dynasty ruling over them that can't do anything about it. And there's also been, I believe there's a famine, there's a massive flood in uh, the Yellow River that just caused a, a lot of food shortages. So like all of these factors are playing a part and suddenly now you've got this, this powder keg and you just need a spark. You just need two German missionaries to get killed and suddenly it's a full-blown rebellion. So I just wanted to point that out that there's already these other factors contributing to this unease. Yeah. It, uh, it, it pains me that we can't talk about more in our in our podcast because the Japanese and the Qing had just fought a major war over Manchuria, the first Sino-Japanese war, and a lot of people died. So there were multiple mu- there were multiple wars, multiple famines, multiple floods, and natural disasters. Um, it is not a good time in China. So to your point, Colin, about the unemployment, bad things happen when unemployment gets super high. So this, uh, the boxers or the righteous and harmonious fists uh, began to gain power um, and win over the hearts and minds of, of uh, the Chinese people. So in 1897, a crisis happened. So some fellas from a different martial society called the Big Sword Society, they stormed into a German uh, mission and killed two missionaries. Uh, this became known as the Juye Incident. Uh, and this kind of started the the domino effect, if you will, to what led to the Boxer Rebellion because uh, the Kaiser's response to this Juye uh, incident was to demand concessions. <laughs> uh, you know, Germany, you know, from Germany's perspective at this time, they, from a national standpoint, they felt like they were late to the colonization game. Uh, some people may have heard of the, of the term, the scramble for Africa. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, Germany had saw the British, the French, the Portuguese, the Dutch, you know, all these different empires. And they're like, we need a colonial empire too. So the Germans, and I think we did mention this briefly in our first episode in this series, uh, this was the time when Germany demanded uh, a city on the Shandong Peninsula called Liaodong. Liaodong, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the major major cities in there, and he's like, "Hey, we as as reparation for killing two of our missionaries, you're going to give us this entire city." <laughs> because he saw Hong Kong, he saw Macau. He Germany wants a port city too. <laughs> it, it's interesting that they use it, it, two missionaries getting killed. That's bad, but that they demanded that they want this large land port. It. It's almost kind of like they saw this as an as an opportunity, opportunity from a dying. Yeah. yeah, it was very opportunistic. And mind you, Germany is only at this point about twenty six years old as a nation. Before that, it was you know we talked about them being late. Like at, before the Franco Prussian War and Otto von, von Bismarck, they were a bunch of different nation states, and suddenly they unified. So they are a relatively new power. So it's not surprising to think that they would use this as an opportunity to say, we can gain some ground very quickly. Um, but it's mostly opportunistic. It's not exactly a fair concession, like giving an apology or something like that. They they wanted land right. in a city. Yeah, it, it was very much. And actually, Kaiser Wilhelm faced a lot of uh, blowback in Europe in particular uh, on that. But without going too far on that, uh, what what his demands, what Germany's demands 
sparked was another scramble for concessions. As we saw similar to what started the entire American-Chinese relationship in the Treaty of Wangsha, that was one, after the first opium war and the Brits were able to gain these concessions from the Qing by blowing up a some boats. Everybody else is like, well, we want concessions too. We want most favored nation status too. So there's this, there's these cyclical waves um, where when one European power gets some concessions, everybody wants them. So what ended up happening was the, uh, so the Germans, the French, the British, the Russians in Japan all signed different treaties with the Qing government after this Juye incident that granted them spheres of influence, where essentially these nations almost carved up the entire nation of China. So we're not just talking about treaty ports anymore, but rather entire areas. So for example, the Japanese were granted the entire a province of Fujian, which is a major coastal province in like southeastern China on the coast. Um, the Brits were granted all of northern China as their a sphere of influence. The Russians were granted all of Manchuria. So we're not talking about port cities anymore. We're talking about huge swaths of territory that uh, didn't it, – it wasn't like a territorial thing. They didn't like carve up China – Rather, this was the precursor to that. So this was the idea of, hey, we – this land doesn't – like we're not going to plant British flags or Japanese flags here, but relative to the other nations, we kind of own this sphere of influence. The United States did similar things with the Monroe Doctrine. We basically called all of Central and South America the entire Western Hemisphere – under the American sphere of influence, just in, you know, we, they didn't belong to the United States. Rather, we were just posturing to the other European powers. Hey, like this is our sphere of influence. And if you want to do anything, you kind of need to talk to us first type deal. Um, the Russians after world war two tried to carve up Europe in spheres of influence. Um, so like it, the spheres of influence is a very old thing and it's gone on a lot. So, this was kind of the final straw. Carving up China in these various spheres of influence um, was was kind of the final straw. And what happened was some uh, some major dissension, not a civil war, but like a major issue started forming in the Qing court. So the emperor uh, began uh, what they called 100 Days of Reform in 1898. And these 100 days of reform uh, were intended to modernize the administration, basically help Qing, uh, China get its act together so that it could stop being basically obliterated by all these imperial powers. Well, that was primarily pushed by the more liberal elements within the Qing court. Well, interestingly enough, there's another side of the Qing court that thought – a more conservative approach, a more orthodox approach um, would be better. And that faction was led by the Empress Dowager, uh, I'm not going to say her name right, Cece. <laughs> That's probably not the right way to best. say it. Give it your best. Yeah. Give it your best. Cece. That's what I'm going to call her, whole Cece. Uh, man, I should have looked that up. Um, Cece. It's probably like Cece. Or something like that. But anyway, uh, CC here. Um, so the Empress Dowager was a very strong figure. And as a matter of fact, we could do an entire podcast series on this lady's life because she started as a concubine to the, to the previous emperor. And it was her son that ended up becoming the emperor. Well, this lady was such an original gangster that she didn't like, um, the reforms that her son was implementing. So she put him in house arrest and took over the administration herself. It's amazing that she came in and grounded her own son, the emperor and said, son, you're acting a fool and I'm going to, I'm going to lock you up in the house and I'm going to take control. Yeah. Very, uh, for, for the Chinese history nerds out there, very like, uh, I love the, uh, romance of the three kingdoms. Very like, 
if people know who Cao Cao is, uh, Cao Cao was the guy who like basically saved the Han Emperor from these bad guys. And he was like, yeah, come move in my court. I'll do everything. Uh, you know, I'll keep you safe. I may issue some edicts in your name from time to time. You're still the emperor. Don't worry, dude. I'm just a good, loyal follower. And he basically became the emperor of China for <laughs> for all intents and purposes. So it's like, you know, and, and today, Cao Cao is known as being very crafty, very smart, very powerful and wise. So, um, you know, what what – Sita CC here uh, is is doing by grounding by grounding the emperor and taking over. She was more sympathetic to the conservative elements within uh, the Qing administration. I was going to say, it, looking at this hundred days of reform, though, I, I can't help but see it's it's too little, too late, like way too late. Um, yeah. And I think that was why it was not successful. A, you had two warring factions between the more liberal and the more conservative side. With heck, even the the uh, the empress and her son had obvious, very differing views on how they wanted to proceed. But the Qing, this is by and large way too late. They wanted to self strengthen. It was kind of like their way to say, okay, we're going to embrace some of this Western these Western ideals, and we're going to try and take the good and combine it. But it just fell flat on its face. And I would say you should contrast that with Japan, who also at the same time, Western powers came to and said, you know, they basically said, Japan, you're going to, you need to open up. We're going to come trade with you. There was a lot of cultural conflict in Japan as well. Uh, We've all seen The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise, but they adopted it much more successfully. And and, and to point out, they were a member of the Eight Nation Alliance and they modeled their military after Western militaries. And they brought in, they brought in the outside influence, but at the same time managed to keep a lot of their culture intact. And they were successful, but the Chinese were not. And you can see where it, it altered the trajectory of the two countries. Yeah. It, it, it might be worthwhile maybe in a in a future episode to kind of compare and contrast Chinese relations with the West and Japanese relations with the West. Because just listening to you talk, in the in the Meiji Restoration, for the most part, Japanese posture was we are going to learn from the West. Yes. Exactly. The, you know, the shogunate didn't like it. A lot of the samurai didn't like it. It wasn't a one hundred percent, you know, we all love it. Uh, similarly, the Japanese actually did this twice, and I think War people Are you about to after talk about World after, War II. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yep. There's a great book called "Embracing Defeat," uh, and I think this is less popular because it was almost exclusively the United States, and not. Whereas in the Meiji Restoration, they brought in British advisors, they brought in German advisors, they brought in American advisors. Like it was a very multinational effort. Whereas after World War II, you know, you got to think like. Japan had been receiving its own propaganda for decades uh, uh, about how the West was evil, about how the West, you know, Americans were going to eat their babies when they landed in their territory, like all this cr- uh, crazy stuff. And then all of a sudden it was kind of like they as a society were like, hey, we're just going to learn from them again. We're there. There was propaganda in the late 40s and 50s about the received hand. And there would be these like political cartoons uh, that would show like what looked like this hand from God coming down to help the poor Japanese person. And it symbolized the United States. <laughs> we literally just fought a war with them. And yet they just, they just switched to, oh, now we're going to listen again. It's amazing. So it, <sighs> I just want to make this point because it's it's pretty interesting. So when the U.S. defeated the Japanese in, for a variety of different reasons, but one of them was the manufacturing capabilities of the United States and their ability mm-hmm. to mass produce weapons. They were – I think one of the imperial uh, admirals, when he found out that the U.S. had uh, ships that were just used to haul ice cream around, he knew that they were going to lose. Mm-hmm. And then after World War II – Um, Japanese businessmen would come to the United States to like Ford factories to understand their process. And if you've ever taken like Lean Six Sigma training, um, there's a lot of American and Japanese um, principles that get intertwined over the decades. And one of the things that the Japanese businessmen came over and they recognized was the U.S. has a process to mass produce and we need to learn that. 
You ever right. heard term like Kanbans or anything like that? That's Japanese. That was them taking their methodology and combining hmm. it with the Ford factories. But they they were blown away by the fact that we could produce like a B24 in a day. Like they, right. they just it, they couldn't comprehend that kind of power, but they saw it yeah. and they said, we want to do it. And as a matter of fact, we're going to make that process better. And that's why you yeah. have to- that's why everywhere in the United States, you have Toyota cars driving around because they took that's the American right. process and they made it better. Colin, that is a that's a great point. And kind of bringing this back to China, China is they they didn't do that. <laughs> they didn't. They were very unlike uh, Japan in uh they had a much more difficult time mobilizing their entire population to try to learn from the west now this assumes and again i'm knitting my own our own biases here it assumes that china had things to learn right um but again just kind of comparing and contrasting this with japan um Japan was able to fight back somewhat. Yes, at the end of World War II, they ultimately lost, but Japan was able to fight back. Japan crushed the Russians in 1905 um, and scared the daylights out of a lot of people. It definitely woke up the United States to go, oh, shoot, we've got this very powerful neighbor neighbor across the pond here. Um, but China, China's never had that Japanese moment of, oh, we're just going to learn from uh, – from the West. Interestingly, though, the the time in which China probably came the closest was after the the Mao era, when um, once when Chairman Mao died, and they had just finished all of these unsuccessful uh, reforms, pr- it, primarily the Cultural Revolution. That. Um, that was not a good time of reform. So when Chairman Mao died, that was really the closest China's ever come to going, hey, we should probably learn from the West. And I, I really wish we had some Chinese listeners <laughs> because I would say like, hey, when were relations between China and, and the West, maybe if not the entire world, were best? It was when China actually went, you know what? Let's let's modernize. Let's integrate. Let's globalize. Let's actually take what's good from Western culture and and, and economics primarily, and integrate that in our society. And what happened? China's economy boomed. Literally, millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in China. And it's and it's crazy because I see propaganda all the time that talks about the Chinese Communist Party has done great things to lift people out of poverty. It's like, yeah, because Westerners paid for it. <laughs> like mi- Americans, American businesses, uh, the American government, the Brits, like you name it. It's not just the United States, but primarily the United States have given the Chinese Communist Party billions of dollars, if not trillions over the years, uh, really since that, you know, the late 70s and the 80s and the 90s, things started getting a little weird. Uh, and then, of course, in 2000s, it was like, uh, we're kind of suspicious now. But the point being is that when China did- Maybe they're not our best friends. Yeah. Well, China, like- the uh, kind of similar to here in the Boxer Rebellion, the conservative elements within Chinese society have gone. Oh no, we need to be these China purists here. And what's happening? Their economy today, their economy is going back down. It's slowing way down. They're beginning to not be good players on the global stage. They're not. They're not being good partners. Uh, and I and I do mean that uh, as objective as I can. Like uh, the. Like just nationalizing random businesses and stealing intellectual property, like it's stealing. Like name me a moral standard that says stealing is okay. So this isn't like like relativistic. Like oh, you know, you're saying that because you're American. Like ah, uh, like come on, is there a society in which stealing is a good thing? No, there's not. So uh, point being, kind of bringing this back in the in the the uh, hundred days of reform, the Boxer Rebellion. This hundred days of reform was intended to. Hey, we need to wake up and fix some things. And the conservative elements within the Qing administration were like, "No, this sucks. We're going to fight back because that's what that's what the the Chinese people, the peasants wanted." So, 
the Empress Dowager took over, put the emperor under house arrest, and things began to sour between the Qing administration and uh, the the foreigners. Jay, that's a that's a long. <laughs> We went on a couple tangents there, but you know, to bring it back to the actual rebellion, where did the violence start to break out in this Boxer Rebellion? Yeah, so in 1900, the violence kind of got worse. So this entire time, the Boxers were known for like burning churches, killing Chinese Christians. They called foreigners the primary devils, but then they also called other Chinese that had converted to Christianity either Catholicism or Protestantism, they called them secondary devils. Um, so they, they actually killed more of them than uh, foreigners. Uh, and this had been going on, but in, in 1900, things started um, migrating north to Beijing itself. So um, as, as the violence was getting worse and worse and worse, these foreign governments were going, hey, we're a little concerned that our diplomats, our missionaries, our businessmen who live in Beijing are going to be threatened. So they sent, and they being um, eight different nations, what, like we mentioned before, including the United States, we we sent some like token reinforcements, only a few hundred uh, soldiers to reinforce the embassies. Um for the United States, this included none other than the United States Marines. <laughs> Which the birthday this is was just two because days ago. To this day, yeah, we're recording. We're recording this two days uh, after the birthday. Uh, we'll release it here in probably five days or so after the birthday. But uh, the the point being is that to this day, U.S. Marines guard, quote unquote, and I'm doing air quotes here, guard uh, U.S. embassies around the world. Um, and I, I only do air quotes because embassies have more security than just the Marine, uh, the Marine attachment, uh, there. But, um, if you go to a U.S. embassy, you'll see Marines, uh, standing outside or standing at the gate. And that's kind of, they've been doing this since the Boxer Rebellion. Um, so there were Marines that were sent to, uh, defend the embassy and uh, other nations sent their sailors and Marines too, because, they, the armies were normally kept in the home station and sailors and Marines went and patrolled the foreign seas. Right. So ships were nearby. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, yeah, ships were nearby and that's why we, why we sent the Marines. Well, the boxers began to attack Beijing. So there was these growing things and the Qing administration was kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. The conservative elements within the administration supported the boxers, but they, they were trying to not upset the European powers, right? Because every single time the, the, the Qing had upset the European powers, it ended up with an ero- a further erosion of, um, authority, a further erosion of influence within their own country. And they were just trying to keep the peace. Well, in June of, of 1900, the boxers kind of attacked. And this is what began, uh, what's known as what I mentioned before the siege of the, of the international legations. Um, and you, you were getting, you know, foreigners shooting at boxers and, and other Chinese people, didn't the boxers believe that they were invulnerable from like gunfire, even though some of them used rifles and stuff? Yeah. They, just, they thought they were like invulnerable. So they had like this divine protection for them to attack the the foreign devils. Yeah. What, it's super interesting in, in Chinese society uh, prior to the communists <laughs> was they would always invoke heaven. There was this spiritual, there's the spiritualistic aspect to Chinese society that's not necessarily religious in the formal like liturgical sense that is familiar to Westerners. Rather, it's more ambiguous, almost like the force in Star Wars. That's probably unfair, but like it's this ambiguous kind of blurry force in the world that's that's ever present in in Chinese uh, society. It's it's what helps us understand this mandate of heaven, right? Um, 
and the boxers would appeal to this spirituality and claimed um you know almost almost fatalistically that you know right was on their side heaven was on their side and that heaven would protect them and they claimed to be invulnerable to western bullets which well that, that's why i bring it up because statement. uh I, <laughs> well that's kind of why i bring it up because in this siege there was thousands of boxers have besieged the eight nation alliance here and there's only a couple hundred troops how did the west the the eight nation alliance I keep saying Western powers, but I forget. Keep forgetting that Japan is technically part of this. So, how did the eight nation alliance? Japan's respond? in there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Japan's in there. So, how did the the eight nation uh, alliance respond to this siege? Because it was going on for weeks. Right, right. So the siege lasted a, a grand total of fifty five days, uh, from June to August of nineteen hundred. But so you had this siege going on and the eight nation alliance was like well traditional mil- war- military warfare stipulates that if there's a siege you try to go relieve it so uh the alliance kind of put together this hodgepodge force uh in what became known as the Seymour expedition because it was led by a british vice admiral seymour uh about 2000 troops coming from a port just south east of Beijing, just north of the Shandong Peninsula. And this expedition was intended to go relieve the the legations there in Beijing. Long story short, they never made it. Um, So there was actually a very large boxer force that won a battle against this, um, uh, uh, against the Seymour expedition. Seymour kind of backtracked a little bit and then was like, nah, we can keep going. But then this was the time where the Empress Dowager switched sides. So she went from being, and the Qing administration went from being nominally supportive of the Western powers to then she just straight up declared war on the eight nation alliance, <laughs> which from a from an American standpoint, this helps us understand China. <laughs> and, what I mean, and what I mean by that is that like things are not always as they seem. And what seems from one perspective to be totally out of left field actually has a logical explanation behind it. If we stop and go like, wait a minute, the Chinese actually aren't irrational. They just don't think the same way that we do, but there is mm. a rationality behind it. Well, and it, that's why of, I've been saying this whole time. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, it, it's funny you say like the the way the, the Chinese, I think it was the first episode, the Chinese just sort of swallowed you up and they, they kind of looked at foreigners. That's kind of what happened with the, in practical terms, that's what happened with the Seymour expedition. They started venturing deeper into China and then suddenly they switched sides. And it's like, okay, now we have a few thousand troops basically on their own in the middle of China, surrounded by a host- a now hostile force with no support. Yeah. So after after Seymour got was defeated by the boxers on the way up to Beijing, the 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 Eight Nation Alliance sent a list of demands to the Empress Dowager, which basically like demanded that she execute folks within her own administration that were supportive of the boxers. You know, hey, you've got to come help us against the boxers, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, in one of the the great speeches of of all time, she gives this this speech to her her council, and I'll and I'll read a quote here. Now they, the Western powers, have started the aggression, and the extinction of our nation is imminent. If we just fold our arms and yield to them, I would have no face to see our ancestors after death. If we must perish, why don't we fight them to the death? <laughs> Three things. And this is like I want to say about this that. is fascinating. Three, three yeah, things. One, that's incredibly motivational. A fight to the death. Two, <laughs> it's interesting that she says like their nation. She she was saying that their nation would be destroyed. Not every person would have died or perished. But what she's, I think, what she's really saying is like, hey, us as a Chinese people are. Cult- We've already talked about the erosion of culture in China. This is a cultural conflict. She is saying that we will no longer exist yeah. as a Chinese people and that we have for thousands of years. And then I, you can also see she, there's a spiritual element too, where she looks to, I won't, I won't have a face to my, you know, she's referring to her ancestors. 
So she's saying like, hey, this is also mm-hmm. like we've mentioned a spirit, as Mao Zedong called, a spiritual conflict against the West. And she's kind of appealing to that sort of mandate right. from heaven, the heavenly, you know, the heavenly fist. She's looking toward, you know, the spiritual side of things. So I, I just think that's there's a lot to lot to unpack in that very motivational quote that you just gave. Mm hmm. Yeah. And she talks about saving face. So you even get a cultural element of like a a concept that's really difficult. Like, I think we tangentially understand like what it means to save face. Like, oh, I don't want to look bad. But this isn't necessarily, I don't want to look bad. It's like, I am no longer a whole person standing before the ultimate authority before which I believe I will stand when I die. (laughs) Like it is way deeper than just like, oh, I don't want to look bad. It's I it's wanna, like it is an integral an aspect of her own identity. Yeah, it's not just it's not just ego. It's it's integrity, and I mean that in the like being a whole person uh, before standing before an ultimate authority. Like it is way deeper. Just this aspect of saving face. So, uh, yeah. So what happens um, when she does this is that. She and the Qing government declare war against the Eight Nation Alliance, which is pretty ballsy <laughs> to be like, we're going to declare war on eight countries all at the same time. So how did that work their, out for her? Their armies are already in my country. <laughs> not good. <laughs> and, and to be fair, not good for anybody. Um, in, a, in a very real way, everybody kind of lost the Boxer, the Boxer Rebellion. But um. So specifically before we move on from the Seymour expedition, they never actually made it to Beijing uh, because now that the Qing government was on the side of the boxers, it was just too much for them to go uh, from uh, from Tianjin to uh, to Beijing. What we have here, what because the Seymour expedition was never able to make it to Beijing, we have this super intense and very interesting episode of the siege of the Be- Beijing uh, legations. So you had about 900 troops from Great Britain, Russia, France, Japan, Germany, the United States, Italy, Austria-Hungary, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Spain, and about 2,800 Qing Christians. They were all hemmed up in the area or in an area that is roughly one mile by two miles in, uh, in, in square miles here. This is not a very large space for you know roughly 3,000 people. Not ca- Those are just the combatants, not counting um, the missionaries, the, the diplomats, the business folks that were hemmed up in this uh, legation as well. You go through your food very quickly, by the way, and, they, and this was a siege in the very in the military sense of the term. Lots of fighting. Uh, there was an episode where U.S. Marines like repelled this assault um, from from one of the walls. There was this one piece of artillery that was known as like the international cannon because it's like the uh, the wheels were made in Italy. The bronze was, uh, or not the bronze, but the cannon was was smelted in Great Britain. The crew was Americans. Uh, the bullets were from Russia, or the yeah, it was just kind of like this international hodgepodge. There was an unknown number of boxers in Qing that were um, uh, that had that had sieged this legation. Some estimates are around twenty thousand. That's probably that's the best number. That's what one American who was at the scene estimated, but you know that's that's really hard to tell. So you had about you know three thousand versus twenty thousand. This lasted about a month until there was an armistice, uh, and there was still some occasional fighting for the remainder of the fifty five days. But by and large, everybody just kind of stopped shooting at each other. But the legations were still starving. For the sake of time, the siege ended when a much larger expedition called the Greenlee Expedition finally came uh, to um, uh, relieve the siege. And that expedition had about 20,000 soldiers, much larger than the 2,000 of the Seymour Expedition, uh, to relieve the siege. At the end of the siege in August of 1900, the Empress Dowager decided to move the court from Beijing to uh, Xi'an, which is further, a little bit further west up in the mountains. Interestingly, this is the exact the same province 
uh, or or nearby that Chairman Mao and the Chinese Communists would do their long march to. So kind of that that mountainous region within China. What this led to was the Qing had basically evacuated. The you had this eight nation and eight plus nation alliance um, in charge of Beijing. So they were kind of like, hey, they just tried to kill us. We're going to just start taking things <laughs> and get retribution at our own hands. So this international nation just kind of fanned out along the the Beijing countryside. Uh, really, you know, this huge area amongst all the all the province or the, the province there. And what you get is a really bad thing of history. And I'll cover very quickly. Essentially, all the nations began rape, pillage, and plunder. Um, it's difficult to tell who was doing what and which nations were worse because all the nations essentially just started pointing the fingers at one another. This is one of the earlier conflicts in which the press was actually there. And this created an uproar back in the United States, in, um, in Europe as well. You had people like Mark Twain. Uh, and Vladimir Lenin all speaking out against what the nations were doing in China uh, um, after after the siege here. And, you know, you got to think like for China, the lesson learned here is because we were weak, we were raped, pillaged and plundered by the foreign devils. Uh, so the that's the lesson. It's not a good lesson <laughs> to take away. Um, and um, uh, yeah. So yeah. When you talk about the, the atrocities, I, it's not to, it's not justifying it or anything like that, but when you talk about that expedition, a lot of um, there's a lot of guerrilla warfare that ex- occurred and there's a lot of people that died of disease. You know, there's one with Smedley Butler. Uh, one of his famous accounts was seeing like Japanese soldiers nailed to a wall. I kind of think that a lot of this, the subsequent mutilation and raping and pillaging of China by these eight nation alliance was done out of anger and frustration. So it sort of just escalates the situation because a lot of them that were dying, like getting picked off, and there was a lot of torture that was occurring for you know these eight nation alliance for invading a country that you know mm-hmm. the Chinese and the boxers saw they were the enemy, so we're going to teach them a lesson. And then suddenly uh, they're winning the battle, and now suddenly they're going to get there. Yeah. They're now going to take their uh, pound of flesh in retribution, as well as some artifacts. So it's not really; it's more of just an explanation of how a lot of these conflicts will escalate. And unfortunately, like you said, if you're weak and you lose. Anything that you've doled out uh, is going. You can expect to be given a lot worse. So you're right. I think the Chinese kind of looked at that and said that, and then you know, with the Japanese invasion in World War II and the rape That's of right. you know instances like the rape of Nanking, King, they said ne- you know never again. We're not going to have this. That's probably why they want to take a position of strength is saying like we looked at this and this is bad. We don't want this to happen to our people again. And also, you mentioned the uh, the yeah. press and like Mark Twain being there. Yeah. I think it was a Fulbright who established yeah. actually with the indemnity that the U.S. put on the the Chinese. They actually used that to help that they paid off early. By the way, they actually used that to fund um, scholarships for Chinese Americans to go to school. It was uh, done by Fulbright, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Is just just to show like the U.S. looked on it very unfavorably. Yeah. And this was there were a lot of war crimes, and hmm. it was kind of like okay, this is bad. How do we how do we atone for this? Yeah, no, and let's talk about that indemnity real quick because that's that's kind of how the Boxer Rebellion concludes. So the Empress Dowager signed uh, what what became known as the Boxer Protocol uh, in September of 1901. So from really September of 1900 to September of 1901, that was a long period of kind of uncertainty. There weren't like any real major battles necessarily that took place in the traditional sense. Rather, it was just kind of small skirmishes, pillaging, etc. So in, in 1901, the Empress Dowager signed the Boxer Protocol, it, and she was willing to sign it because there were no additional territorial concessions that were demanded, but a very heavy indemnity of was equivalent in uh, 2010 dollars, 2010 US dollars, uh, equivalent to $61 billion dollars that the Chinese would pay 
So that's like $120 billion in 2022 money. Yeah. <laughs> inflation sucks. Uh, little inflation yeah. joke there. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was a huge, huge indemnity uh, and that carried on. So the Qing dynasty would only last for another 10 years. Uh, it lasted until 1911. And we'll talk about that in our next episode. But uh, the Republic of China, of uh, which Sun Yat-sen was kind of getting a start at this uh, at this same time. They actually paid off. They actually paid off more because they adjusted for inflation a little bit. But uh, and they paid it off in uh, 1939. Um, so, and and like uh, like Colin mentioned, the United States actually used its in, its portion of the reparations to start a scholarship fund for Chinese students. Uh, so there, because of the backlash that we, I wish we had more time to get more in depth. Uh, M, but the backlash here in the United States was was kind of anti imperialist and pro China. Uh, that was the public sentiment in the United States, and that's why we we use this indemnity to, to uh, fund uh, Chinese students to go to uh, American universities. Some some points about why this matters today. In closing, here there's a phrase that started in this time and continues to today in China. In the, uh, that's, this is the phrase, the people are afraid of the officials. The officials are afraid of the foreigners and the foreigners are afraid of the people. And, and why this came about was the, the reason why the Western powers from the Chinese perspective didn't demand territorial concessions and were, were kind of ready to like get out of China at this point was they saw the impact their influence was having specifically against the Chinese people. Uh, and they were not prepared. They thought they could manipulate the administration, but they saw the people had kind of had enough at that point. The Boxer Rebellion marks the high watermark of Western imperialism in China. Japanese imperialism would would get much worse, uh, kind of culminating into the second Sino-Japanese War um, of 1936 to 1945, uh, also known as World War II <laughs> here, in, <laughs> here in, uh, in the West, but uh, also known as their part in World War II. But uh, there wouldn't really be much, many more unequal treaties aside from what local warlords would kind of work out within Western powers. Um, So one of the key takeaways here for Chinese was by the power of the people, we can repel the foreign invaders. So there was a sense in which they felt like the Box Rebellion was successful in that they f- they learned they had a weapon to use against the foreigners, and that is the people themselves. This is important because one of the key aspects of communism in the Chinese Communist Party is they do see it as a people's republic, right? There's this emphasis. There's there's this very now liberal Zedong notion. Absolutely utilizes that. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, kind of furthermore. Um, what we see here is the Qing dynasty is on the verge of collapse. And as we'll get to in our next episode, the the Qing dynasty collapse and multiple warlords begin taking over. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll get into more further de- uh, episodes, but this was very much the final straw in the, in the Qing dynasty. <laughs> Uh, one one last little anecdote, just for American policy. Uh, some some historians see that uh, William McKinley's decision to send a, a total of five thousand troops, the vast majority of those were Marines, uh, to China as the first time that an American president kind of got us involved militarily uh, in a foreign adventure without the authorization of Congress. Uh, so fun fact there. <laughs> and then lastly, like what we. S- what we see here is just one more episode in the century of humiliation um, in China. So China sees like our weakness allows the foreigners to take advantage of us. And when you look at what Xi Jinping, why he's so popular is because he's another China strongman. He's the guy uh, that's going to, quote unquote, make China great again uh, and restore China to its its position of uh, of power, yeah, in in on the global stage. Uh, 
This is why Vladimir Putin was so popular. This is why Donald Trump was so popular. Not trying to equivocate these gentlemen. I'm just trying to say like the narrative of we need a strong leader to make our country strong. It's the same, it's the same narrative in all three of these different countries and all three of those different leaders. So, uh, the, and they look back to the boxer rebellion to kind of help, uh, help justify that. Jay, thanks for that. That was a great episode. Honestly learned a lot about the boxer rebellion and why it's so significant in this, um, chapter of U S and Chinese relations. And, uh, you know, the, like you said, the high watermark for uh, foreign influence in these hundred years of humiliation for China. So I hope you as the listeners enjoyed this as much as we enjoyed uh, researching this. Um, we are going to talk next week about the collapse of the Qing dynasty, um, the subsequent internal strife within China and the rise of the, China, the Republic of China in the decades leading up to World War II. Um, a lot happens there. So you know, stay tuned. I hope you're enjoying this series. Also, if you are on social media, uh, Jay and I are on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So give us a like, a follow. I think we also are on YouTube as well. We post there. So if you'd like to listen to the episode on YouTube, um, if you do like what we're doing here at the Loins of History, please give us a, a five-star review. Uh, it definitely helps the algorithm, helps get the word out and the messaging out. Give us any feedback on what you think about the episode. Um, you can hit us up on social media if you have different ideas or questions or want us to expand on anything. Um, in one of our future episodes or just chat with us directly. Um, we have a Patreon page that you can support us or through Anchor. Um, and again, we really do appreciate you listening and we hope you're enjoying the series. Thank you all and look forward to talking with you next week. 